I'm going to see you twice today. Uh, and this first hour is sort of um, useless. You won't learn anything. Um, just sit back and really, instead of trying to sort of teach you something, I want to sort of give you, uh, share with you a perspective. Maybe change your mind about what you think about statistics or what the typical astronomer thinks about statistics. Um, and sort of to just catch you up on this novel and rather small subfield called astrostatistics and its, and its sister field, astroinformatics. Um, and so this is sort of broad background. This afternoon I'll be talking about a field of statistics called time series analysis that is um, relevant for a fraction of, of exoplanetary research. And, um, uh, and there we'll actually learn something. <clears throat> now, Every single thing we do in terms of observational work in exoplanetary astronomy is statistical in nature. Um, it's extremely hard to find planets, okay? Uh, uh, if you're gonna use a Doppler signal, uh, usually you need a million to one uh, um, um, sensitivity in, 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 in velocity space. Well, we're, we're tr working on getting better than a meter a second compared to the speed of light. Uh, if you're doing direct imaging, you need a billion to one sensitivity. Uh, uh, if you're doing transmission spectroscopy of, uh, of atmospheres, you're again, as, as Chas uh, uh, um, mentioned, you have to subtract two big numbers and get a teeny weeny weeny difference between them. Or else you're looking for signals that aren't so faint, but they're very rare. So for instance, if you want to um, um, uh, find a reasonable sample of transit signals, you have to spend four years to monitor 200,000 stars. That's what the Kepler mission has been doing. Uh, or uh, 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 you have to be ogle, and you have to uh, stare at, at hundreds of millions of stars for years on end just to find a, a very tiny number of microlensing events that have planets. Um, and, and, um, and when you finally succeed in finding your planets, and of course we've now succeeded at the level of thousands of, of, of confirmed and... We infer that this is just a tiny fraction of the total. So that we, 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 we have to correct this. Oh, that's not quite the right symbol there, but that's an Ada Earth symbol uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, we, we have inferred that when you look up at, at the sky at night, that most of the stars have planetary systems, and that somewhere like 1% to 10% of them, of, uh, somewhere in there is the best estimate for Ada Earth, of the fraction of stars, all stars, that have Earth-like planets and Earth-like orbits that are potentially habitable. Well, this is phenomenal. If we could only find them, we'd find them in every star. Instead, we have to struggle and struggle and struggle to find them in a small fraction of stars. So, th so the result of this is that, I mean, think of this. This is sort of like a, a, a um, okay, that was cool. Uh, this is sort of like a Gallup poll, okay, those of you from America, right? They interview a thousand astronomers. You know, are you gonna vote for, for, I'll go back a couple years, for Mitt Romney or Barack Obama. And, 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 and they have to go from 1,000 uh, uh, um, uh, statements to 300 million uh, uh, people. And, and, and so the same kind of problem uh, that the political scientist has, uh, the astronomer has as well, particularly the exoplanetary astronomers. So therefore, <laughs> more so than most, there are a lot of astronomers who don't need that much statistics. You know, maybe they study uh, the morphology of a few galaxies, or they study a small sample of Seifert galaxies, or, 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 or some barium stars or something. And they, they may not need much statistical savvy, uh, but, but we do, okay? Um, and so I'm going to uh, give you a very broad uh, uh, sort of conceptual and historical overview of the role of statistics in astronomy, and, and, and sort of bring you up to date on certain things. And at the end, I'm going to talk to you about a software system, which is not in the hands-on session, I actually have one page of my talk this afternoon that's actually going to show you some, some R scripts. Uh, uh, but R is the language of modern statistics, and we should be aware of it. OK, so let me start. So if we're going to talk about astrostatistics, we should say we'll talk about what is astronomy and what is statistics. What is astronomy? It's easy. Astronomy is, is a jargon for really two things, astronomy and astrophysics. Astronomy is taking a telescope and looking with greater sensitivity than the human eye and greater wavelength range and studying the stars and the planets and the galaxies or in the universe around us with telescopes, basically, since Galileo. 
in astrophysics is, uh, since, well, I guess uh, since uh, celestial mechanics after Isaac Newton, but mostly in the 20th century, when we take the, the physics that are learned in the laboratories of places like Caltech, quantum mechanics and thermodynamics and electrodynamics and, 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 and general relativity, and we apply the physics to the uh, observations that we take of the stars and the planets, and we, and we understand the physical nature, the astrophysics of the stars. Okay, nobody talks about this. We all agree. There's no paradigm problems in astronomy at all. Okay, so then if you go ask a statistician or a bunch of statisticians, an ensemble of statisticians, what is statistics? They can't agree. They don't even know what it means to be a, what statistics is. So there's one figure you should know about. His name is Sir R. A. Fisher, Twenty, early, first half of the 20th century. Um, I don't know. If you took Edwin Hubble and Martin Rees and Shamayor and wrap them up. That, uh, R. A. Fisher is very important. Okay, uh, there's no astronomer like him. Um, so one thing he wrote back in the 1920s in one of his many books is uh, uh, um, uh, briefly, in its most concrete form, the object of statistical methods is the reduced reduction of data. Now we as astronomers really understand that, and frankly, we're pretty good at it, right? We have these CCDs, we get these megabytes and gigabytes, and now we get these petabytes. And we, we need to reduce it down to a, a few uh, figures and a few tables, a few numbers that we can put into an abstract conclusion to understand, to, to write a study. And we have to reduce down uh, by enormous factors the information. So we, we, we sort of really understand that part of statistics. And it still is a crucial part of statistics. If you ask Wikipedia a couple of years ago, I watched Wikipedia. They keep on changing the first sentence of the page on statistics. It's really odd. OK, statistics is the mathematical body of science that pertains to the collection and analysis. That's sort of what, what, what Fisher was talking about. But then also the interpretation or explanation, and also the visualization or presentation of data. Okay. Then in 2005, they took out the word mathematical. I don't know why. Jesse. Crazy, right? Okay, so so there's no there's no math in statistics, right? Okay, as of 2015. Okay, uh, 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 and 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 so it's sort of been broadened, and particularly the word interpretation and explanation, because that's equivalent to essentially an astronomy of going from astronomy to astrophysics. That yeah, we want to just collect and reduce our data, our observations, but we want to understand them. And of course, we have a tremendous advantage. We have Newton's laws. We have quantum mechanics. We actually understand a lot of what's going on that um, the poor old um, statistician uh, doesn't have when they deal with biological scientists or social scientists and um, uh, things like that. Now, I've another fa figure not quite as famous is Sir D.R. Cox. He's still alive. He's in his 80s from Oxford. Um, um, and. Um, um, uh, he actually said something back in an early book in the 1950s that says a statistical inference carries us from observations to conclusions about, so let's say from samples to conclusions about populations. So the underlying population are all the stars in the galaxy, and the sample is your small sample of micro lens or transiting or radio velocity planets, right? So you have, this is the scallop pole problem, going from a small sample to an underlying population. So this particular concept that this is part of statistics, not all of statistics, is very, very relevant to exoplanetary astronomy. OK, so now we have statistics. So the, you ask the statisticians, how do statistics relate to science? OK, and it ends up bizarrely, in my opinion, most of the 20th century statisticians of note are pessimists. They're just, they're incredibly negative about this, OK? So, George Box, who just, just died, he was the son-in-law of R.A. Fisher, he wrote very famously, essentially all models are wrong, but mm, some are useful. Okay. All models, your binary star models are all wrong. Okay, come on, George Box, this is crazy. C.R. Rao, also in his 80s, if not his 90s, uh, 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 the most, uh, uh, have more gold medals than any other living astronomer, uh, living statistician. He wrote a, 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 an autobiographical book uh, 20 years ago, and he quoted Ozzyander's preface to Copernicus. Do you know your history of astronomy, right? Co uh, Co Copernicus says the sun's in the middle of the universe, not the earth. And he was scared to publish because it went against the, the, the trend of the times about the church. And, and his, his uncle, named, named Ozzyander, was a bishop. He said, this is the uncle of Kepler. 
there is no need for these hypotheses that the sun's in the middle to be true or even anything like the truth. It just has to, well, just sort of agree, calculations agree with observations. This is the goal of statistics? Hmm? And then D.R. Cox, in his last book, This Principles of Statistical Inference, okay. The object of statistics, I won't read it all, is, is, is as far as feasible as to interpret your empirical data. The extremely challenging issues of scientific inference uh, it's sort of broader to try to bring to coherence a whole bunch of different things. And the use, if any, of quantitative notions of probability is unclear. Depressed people, okay? They didn't meet astronomers, okay? And so I'm a positivist, okay? And here's a somewhat less famous person, but somewhat I agree with. His name is Phil Gregory, a retired radio astronomer from British Columbia. And he wrote a lovely book on Bayesian methodology for the physicists and the astronomers uh, a, a few years ago. And in his preface, he says the following. Now, the first sentence is standard sort of mid 20th century uh, scientific method, uh, Karl Popper type method. Okay? The goal of science is to unlock nature's secrets. Our understanding comes from the development of theoretical models capable of explaining existing observations and then using explanations to test to, to, to give new predictions which are testable and, and, and science progresses by a series of, 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 of predictions and tests and, and falsifications. But the new sentence is this. Fortunately, a variety of sophisticated mathematical and computational approaches have been developed to help us through this interface. The interface from, from data to models. The interface from astronomy to astrophysics. And these go under the general heading of statistical inference. So this means that the, essentially this more interpretive aspect of statistics is the way we link, not only we reduce our data from, from petabytes down to kilobytes so we can understand them, and then to interpret them and model them to go from astro astronomy to physical understanding. Well, if you take this broad approach, ladies and gentlemen, it means much of what we do as astronomers is statistics. <laughs> and we don't even know that. I mean, we don't think of it that way. We think of it as doing astronomy. But it means that there's a very intimate relationship between what we do and statistical methodology, more intimate than most of us sort of realize. So for 30 years, I've been talking to astronomers uh, statisticians, rather. And, and, and I've, I've distilled it all onto one page. So this is my best slide, okay? The rest of it's sort of useless. Um, so this is what I think that a, a statistician would say to an astronomer after sort of getting to know you and thinking about you and saying, okay, I can suggest in general over your whole career how you might sort of proceed in terms of analyzing your data. First, this is just a restatement of the positivist statement. I think the this is me, okay. I think the application of statistics can reliably quantify information that's embedded in your data. And, and now I'm sort of listening to D.R. Cox and, and C.R. Rao, the skeptics. Maybe we won't decide what the model is, but maybe we can help adjudicate the relevance of theoretical models. A little more cautious than some of us are in, 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 in arriving at physical conclusions, okay? But what I do want to say is that this is not a straightforward mechanical enterprise. It's not, oh darn it, there's a loose screw here. Go here, take a screwdriver, turn the screw, put the screwdriver down. And a lot of astronomers view that's what statistical methods are. They're just useful tools and it's pretty straightforward. You get the right screwdriver and you screw it in, okay? But in fact, it's a whole more intellectually complicated enterprise as viewed by the statistician. First, C.R. Ra no, R.A. Fisher, 1922. Explore your data. Don't think too much. Explore your data just sort of like as a bunch of numbers. Maybe there's some bad data. Maybe it has some characteristics and features you didn't expect. Maybe it sort of looks like what you want, <laughs> okay? So explore the data, visualizations and, and non-parametrics, for example, can be used at this point. 
And then if you have, uh, in fact, an astrophysical um, um, sort of um, a question, a scientific question, let me say, state the question clearly. Okay? So is the universe expanding? And so that's not clear enough, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? That doesn't tell you that you want to put, that, 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 that you want to know how, how, how the redshift depends on, I don't know, some characteristic of the galaxy. Okay? It's not precise enough. A lot of astronomers get hung up over not stating clearly what they want, sufficiently clearly that a single mathematical model can be written down. And then they fight about the science because they often have different mathematical models. Okay, now fortunately those of us who deal with, with something as simple as, 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 um, as um, um, a single planet going around a sing, single star, uh, it's often very easy to, 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 to formulate uh, the, the problem, but often it's more complex. So then once you've stated the question, gee, I, I wonder do I have mm, one or two or three planets orbiting this star, then I have to formulate it in a mathematical form. And like I said, if it's Kepler's laws, it's pretty easy, okay? But it's often not so simple. Sometimes the model is what I call a heuristic model, saying, well, I don't really have any physics, I don't really understand it, uh, let me just throw in a power law, see if there's a power law relationship, or a power law with an exponential cutoff, which we call the Schechter function, but it's really the gamma function, and, 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 and maybe it's heuristic, but maybe it's astrophysically based. So then we say, okay, we go to the statistician, we say, okay, I have a data set, I have, an astroph I have a question, I have a model, uh, 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 um, what do I do? And they say, well, it's a very simple situation, just use least squares, which dates back a couple centuries, or maybe you should write a likelihood down and, 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 and learn things from the likelihood. That how likely is a given model with a given set of parameters given your data set? Maybe you want to maximize the likelihood. Maybe I, you might, the statistician might say, excuse me, um, I understand you have a data set from your telescope and I, I understand you have a model. So do you, do you know anything else? And you can say, well, well sure, <laughs> I got prior information. I mean, I know that masses are never negative. I know that, 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 that 90, you know, 100% eccentricities are incredibly unlikely. I, I, know, I know the mass of my, masses of my stars follow the, the Saul-Peter-Chabrier mass function. And I say, oh, you have prior knowledge. Prior knowledge with likelihoods leads to Bayesian inference. Okay, it's a way of incorporating prior knowledge into the calculation of, 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 of your data and your model. Okay, sometimes you want to do it and sometimes you don't. Okay, it's not obvious. What am I doing here? I gotta go backward. Oh, this is, you're gonna see this all the time because the buttons are backwards, okay? So every, every, everyone's gonna do this mistake. Okay. Um, so, so, so that's the statistical method. It's basically usually uh, non-parametrics, least squares, maximum likelihood, or Bayesian. No, that's that kind of choice. <clears throat> so then I gotta calculate. Now what I find is that most astronomers whip through those four, those four steps. In like five minutes, they think they know it all, and they immediately then spend a month and write a code. Well, it's almost the opposite. You should spend a month thinking about it and don't write any code ever. You never have to write a statistics code in the rest of your life. Okay, it's all been written. It's all in R. Okay, and I'll tell you about R at the end. Okay, and then you gotta think. Remember D.R. Cox and C.R.L. These guys are brilliant. They spend their 90 years talking, thinking about working with scientists on statistics. They're very skeptical. So be a little skeptical. As Chaz said, three sigma is not always three sigma. It's not necessarily scientifically meaningful. So what's statistically meaningful is not necessarily scientifically meaningful. So you, you have to think and try to judge. My personal way of doing it is often you're not really sure exactly how to formulate it or exactly what method. And my personal opinion is do it five times in five different ways. Not just one path from your data to your conclusion, but do that, your best guess, and then do a few others and see whether or not, the way that I phrase it is, is you don't want your science result to depend on arbitrary choices of methodology. And I, I worry about this. Uh, I have several roles recently. Okay, one of my roles is since, since, since January 1st, I'm the first ever Statistical Scientific Editor of the AAS Journals, the APJ and the AJ. 
So that means that 40% of the world's astronomy research whizzes by me like a fast train. And I'm supposed to try to like, give advice on statistics. Okay. So it's both a privilege and, and crazy okay. <laughs> at the same time. And, 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 and this is what keeps me up at night, is the judicious evaluation. It's not that astronomers aren't doing something intelligent, but, but, uh, but are they doing something that gives a unique answer and a reliable answer? And that's actually not simple, because our problems are quite complicated. Here's some more random thoughts after spending 30 years with statisticians. Um, it's not our fault that we're not too good at it. Not entirely our fault. Okay, it's, modern statistics is absolutely huge. Okay, uh, 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 and, and, and they have terrible jargon. I mean, every method has two obscure names associated with it. Like, oh, the Cromer von Mises test. And what about the Anderson Darling test? And oh, well, then there's a Kamogoro Smirnoff test. And by the way, they all do the same things. Those three I just mentioned. Okay, so how do you know which one to use? Oh. How do you even find them? Okay, how do you even know what's going on? It's very confusing. Okay, they're not very good at teaching us. Okay, they, 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 it, it's really complicated. Sometimes there's statistics, statistics meaning statistical operations, which are based on, ma on mathematical proofs, and the mathematical proof that only of this and this and this is precisely accurate, accurately true. Then, only then is this answer reliable, and this is the reliability. This field is called mathematical statistics, full of theorems and lemmas. If there's a theorem, it's powerless to violate the theorem. You should never violate the theorem. I mean, 2 plus 2 is not 5, right? So if there's a theorem, you've got to obey it. How do you know there's a theorem? A lot of theorems were written in the 1930s. How do you know? You don't. Jessie knows. She has a PhD in statistics, OK? We don't. It's really a problem figuring out mathematical statistics. Sometimes there are issues which they've been debating for decades, and they actually don't have a theorem, or they have conflicting theorems, and they don't know which one's right. And one of them is, you know, I think you might hear this from Dr. Ford, Eric Ford, my, my colleague, Eric Ford, tomorrow. Should you use the Akayiki information criterion or the Bayesian information criterion in order to penalize the likelihood for measure different, two different models, like a three-planet model or a two-planet model or something like that? Well, there are theorems on both sides of that one. And they've been discussing it since roughly 1980, and they haven't decided which one's right. So uh, what do we do? I don't know. Okay. And then uh, this is my favorite one. There's a couple places in statistics where they have a theorem that there is no theorem. OK, if you get bored with me, go to Wikipedia and look up the no free lunch theorem. There's no way to choose the classification method if all you have is data and, and, and classification problem. Oh, this is terrible. How do we do science? So all I could say is, ladies and gentlemen, is this is the real world, a huge gigantic field of statistical methodology and all sorts of confusing sort of theoretical basis to it, that's behind it. And you got to make sure that your arbitrary choices in wandering around in statistics don't actually change what you publish in the app, Jay, or I'm going to get you. No, no, no. I'm, I mean, then you're not doing good science, which is why Box and, and Cox and Rao are so skeptical, okay? Your science may not be reliable, which I find a little frightening. I, that's why I sometimes say maybe you should try things like non-parametrics, things that are so simple there's no model, and, 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 and it's just invariant everything. I even worry that the science will change. You just, you just take a logarithmic transformation or not. Who told you to take a log of your mass variable? Who told you? Well, your professor did. Everyone does it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an arbitrary choice. Why not take the square root? You don't want your science to depend on that. Okay, worries me. Okay, and then you have to just think. So we should be knowledgeable, increasingly knowledgeable in our use of statistics and judicious in our interpretation. What I'd like to say is, look, we take a scholarly approach to astronomy, our stars, our galaxies, our planets. We take a scholarly approach to physics. We all learn the latest quantum mechanics and thermodynamics and relativity. Let's take a scholarly approach to statistics. Why should you be doing 19th and early 20th century statistics? Do you do 19th and early 20th century astronomy? No, you would never think of it. 
to be left out of your community. So let's improve ourselves. Okay? So that's, that's part of my message. Okay, so briefly in just a couple slides, I'm going to give you a history, starting with the ancient Greeks. Okay? So Hipparchus wanted to know the length of a year. There's two ways for an ancient society to find the length of a year. One is to build Stonehenge and measure it every year. Right, oh, I'm sorry. 365.25, blah, 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 blah. If you don't get the 0.25 right, then your calendar gets bad after a few centuries, and then you're planting your crops at the wrong time. So if you're agrarian, you need to know this. If you're a long-lived agrarian society, you need to know this. So the one thing to do is to build Stonehenge. But Hipparchus had another idea. He's going to measure it once, or rather about a few times. So he went to certain wells in Aswan or something, and he measured it. He got 364, maybe, and 366, 367 days. He says, how do I get the best value? How do I know what the true value is? Or what we would call the best estimator. So what he did is he said, I'm going to take my smallest one and my biggest one of a bunch of measurements and just go to the middle where there's no measurement. It's not crazy. But it's sensitive to outliers. One bad data point ugh, pulls it off. So um, in the medieval times, some theologians thought about it and said, ah, measure it once and stop. <laughs> then you know the answer. OK, now aside from the issue of theology, OK, it's not a bad point. You keep on measuring, and it gets wider and wider distribution. It's not improving. It's getting worse. So Galileo, in his dialogues on the two systems, discussed about the use of the mean, the average. Tycho Brahe used the mean up in, 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 in Sweden. Used the mean. He was, also, he was brilliant. He, the modernist, modernist scientific statistics is Tycho Brahe, in my opinion. He's my, my hero. Okay. It wasn't until the 19th century that the mean was really established firmly as the way of doing this in astronomy, and we still use the mean today. So you go to some, you go to some statisticians in the 21st century. Sir, we use the mean. Of course, this is right. And, and he or she says, oh, no. <laughs> uh, we sort of would recommend you use the median today because it's more, even more robust against outliers than the mean is. And so I so, said, so, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't want to use the medium because there's no uncertainty of the medium. I need the standard deviation. And they say, well, <laughs> do you have a computer? So it's bootstrap it. Okay? If you bootstrap it on something called the median absolute deviation, the MAD, it's all in Wikipedia. It's all very simple code. It's all in R. So maybe you should be estimating the length of the year using the median and the bootstrapped uncertainty of the median. Okay? Whoa. We're still discussing after 2,000 years how to estimate the length of the year. So the big event, as Chaz uh, suggested, was around 18 to 18, 1800 to 1820, when three brilliant and competing mathematicians wrote down the theory of these squares and the Gaussian normal distribution and associated statisticals for, 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 for getting things like uh, the orbital parameters of, of the moons of Jupiter and of the, of the comets and, and of the solar system. And, of course, we still use those same techniques today for, for, um, for, for exoplanetary research. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, do you know what Gauss's job was? Carl Friedrich Gauss. I think of him as a physicist and as a mathematician. you know what his job was? Uh, he had Chaz's job. He was director of an observatory in Germany for like 30 years. He was surrounded by astronomers. He was probably doing, I don't know, budgets and, 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 and personnel. Okay? So he, actually, he was, he was a And every single prominent astronomer of, in Europe and the United States of the late 20th, 19th century all worked in statistics. They all were statisticians. The astronomers were the statisticians, and the statisticians were the astronomers until roughly 1900, when everything broke apart. And they went off to the human sciences. They went off to demography and economics and psychology and medicine and politics, the Gallup polls. And we, and, and they, they also, do you know what R.A. Fisher's job was? He, he fought with the professors at Cambridge, so he didn't become a professor at Cambridge or Oxford. He worked for Her Majesty's Agricultural Service. Okay? It's not a joke. One of the reasons why California agriculture works so well is the statistical 
work uh, done by Fisher and others in the early part of the 20th century. Similarly for American uh, uh, manufacturing. And we not only discovered uh, 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 um, uh, Newtonian mechanics, which we did back in the 1700s, we then discovered electromagnetism, quantum, all the 19th and early 20th century physics all worked on the stars and the quasars and the planets, and we just became astrophysicists. And so by the middle to the end part of the, of the 20th century, the astronomers and statisticians essentially forgot each other. So I was trained with zero classes in the statistics. How many classes in statistics have you taken in your, your educational career? One? Oh, you're self-selected to be here. Two, you're a biased sample. Okay, only a small number. How many? Zero. I was zero. That's, that's still a, almost still half of us. And you're biased in favor of this topic. Okay, okay so, the, so the net result is by the late 20th century, the astronomers didn't know modern statistics, which had blossomed since World War II. And, and the statisticians didn't know a, a star from a galaxy. Okay, they didn't know a quasar from a pulsar. So the net result is that things are lousy, okay? I mean, not all entirely lousy. You'll hear the progress in just a few minutes. But, but all, there are many statistics, many studies in astronomy that use, you know, decades or centuries old methods like Fourier transforms for temporal analysis. You'll hear about other methods this afternoon from me. Uh, Camilo Smirnoff tests and PCA and a few things. And even then, they're, 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 they're misused. So our most... Uh, um, the only page that's gone viral on our web portal called ASAIP is the one called Beware the Kamogoro Smirnoff Test. That basically says it's being misused all the time. In any ways, it's not the most sensitive. You should use the Anderson Darling test that's more sensitive. It does the same thing. So we missed late 20th century statistics, like basically likelihood theory. Maximum likelihood estimation, the powerful EM algorithm, things like the Bayesian information criterion. The bootstrap is there in astronomy, but not enough. We, we, most of us have missed multivariate classification. Now, the best of us have not, okay? But, I mean, the bulk of, of, of classification is still going to a color-color magnitude diagram and looking by eye and drawing lines, okay? That's the way we did it in the 1960s. It's still the way most astronomers do it today, okay? In time series, you'll hear me talk about it. Uh, this afternoon. There's a lot that we don't pay attention to. In spatial point processes, we use something called the two-point correlation function, mostly for galaxy clustering and other things, because a very brilliant man named Jim Peebles told us to do it. But we didn't realize that everyone else is using Ripley's K function, which is the integral of the two-point correlation function, which has better mathematical properties. That's where you write the theorems, not the differential, but the integral. For non-detections, there's survival analysis. This is the one that, I, that got me involved. I walked across in the 1980s to the stat department, found out there's this whole field for dealing with non, for arrow, upper limits. It had been developed for, I don't know, industrial quality control, uh, practical stuff. So, so they, they actually developed it for lower limits. So the instructor and I wrote a couple of classes. I took the class, the graduate class, and we multiplied by minus one, Changed the lower limits to upper limits. Took the math and applied it to galaxies and quasars or whatever. Multiplied by minus one, got the answer. Published two papers in the UPJ in the 1980s. It was the best papers of my career. Thousand citations. Okay? And that's what got me into statistics. Okay? Was that. And then there's lots of other things. And we don't know R. So, at Penn State, we've been doing this now for some time. We, we run a summer school, we're on our 12th year, not our 17th year. Uh, we wrote a textbook from the, from the summer school. Here's the textbook. Um, we're now working on the second edition, Modern Statistical Methods for Astronomy with our applications. And, 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 um, um, and the main purpose of our textbook and of, of our, 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 is to catch you up on things you and your professor missed in the last 50 years of statistics. That's the goal. Provide a foundation. Now, it doesn't help you with your latest paper, but it will give you a foundation. And that's what I'm doing here as well. I go around the world and give these, these, these foundational educational talks just to catch us up a little bit as a community um, um, uh, going forward. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to make another slide like this at, from this workshop. 
we're, we're, instead of being cosmology, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it as exoplanetary astronomy. Okay. So here's a dozen topics in cosmology, which I'm not going to mention. And here's, the, if I were a statistician, what would I call the problem in methodology? And what's interesting is that there's an incredible variety of different statistical fields here. We can't just take one class, let's say I was a sociologist, one class in multivariate analysis, and you can really do a lot of social science. Uh, we, we can't do that. We have to learn all sorts of different fields of statistics in order to do, uh, uh, let's just say, cosmology. <clears throat> that makes it really hard, but also really interesting. It's challenging. There's a lot to do in astrostatistics. It's not just one thing or two things. It's like 10 things. <laughs> Okay, so the good news is that things have really gotten better, particularly since roughly around 2000, okay? First, there's improved access to statistical software. The R and CRAN packages have grown exponentially since then. There are now thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of functions. Uh, and Python, which is the language that we use, is definitely better than the old language called IDL we used to use. Uh, uh, um, it, 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 it's, it's not quite as, as big as Python, as MATLAB, and, and certainly not as big as R, but it's really reasonably, it's no longer poor. <laughs> okay. Our papers have doubled or tripled with the, something called the keyword method statistical in the, in the ADS. So more and more of us are using and thinking about statistical methods in our papers enough to put the keyword in. The source short training courses at Penn State, I, one of you took the, the version in India, I go around and give them elsewhere, and, and, and now there's a new one coming up in Heidelberg. Uh, 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 um, th th there's a lot of what I call informal education, mostly because the uni universities are very slow in developing formal courses, and squeezing it into ast the astrophysical curriculum is very hard. There's re cross-disciplinary research collaborations that have grown. At Carnegie Mellon, there's a long-standing one. At Harvard, there was a long-standing one. At, 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 at Stanford, uh, at Cornell, uh, uh, Berkeley, and, and other places. Basically, where professors of statistics and professors of astronomy sort of have lunch together and sort of talk and get to know each other a little bit up here and, 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 and begin to, to do research. Not as much as there should be in this, mostly because the, there's almost no funding because NSF and NASA won't fund this, which is another way of saying the leadership of our community doesn't think this is important yet. The people who seem to really like it are mostly under 35, most of you. The people over 60 who run the big the operations and decide where the money goes, they don't think this is so important. Back 20 years or 30 years ago, this really wasn't so important, but it is today. <clears throat> Okay, and then every single society you've ever heard of, and some you haven't heard of, have all made a working group or, or something like it. So the International Statistical Institute is the gigantic statistics and things. They have something called the International Astrostatistical Association. The International I Astronomical Union, the IAU, has, has, has a, a new commission. I happen to be president of the new commission on astroinformatics and astrostatistics. <laughs> Your own American Astronomical Society formed a working group a few years ago. Uh, Aneta Smirgowska, she's not part of this. Okay, so the, the president of that is not part of this workshop. But the president of the American Statistical Association in Chicago Women Astro Statistics is here, Jesse Sajewski, who's going to speak to you, well, very shortly, I think next. And the LSST has formed a collaboration, and the IEEE's, who are very important, the engineers are really important in this business, have also begun to sort of wake up to this. And that's one of the points is that it's not always true in exoplanetary research, like in rate of velocities, you're lucky to get 1,000 data points. But there's other fields where there are um, very, very large catalogs of, of, of very, very large data sets uh, 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 and, and data cubes and, and, so it, it, and, and data streams that are just really, really tough. And the virtual observatory is sort of oriented towards big data. So the whole issue of big data in astronomy is, is growing. It's not so much in exoplanetary research uh, where we have terabytes, petabytes, and as a community, exabytes. And that means astroinformatics has grown along with astrostatistics. And they're sort of um, um, related to each other. A cute sort of simplistic way of saying it is the statistician tells you, helps guide you on what to compute, the more intellectual part, 
And the, in, the, the computer scientist helps you perform the computation. And you don't need them if you only have a megabyte. You only need them if you have a terabyte or more. Okay. And so that includes uh, all of these fields here and all sorts of complicated software and hardware. Uh, and, 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 and now there's a growing um, training schools and, and symposia in this field. I want to mention another one of your speakers. He's coming up tomorrow, Eric Ford, who's my colleague at Penn State. Eric is the only astronomer I know who has tiny data sets but needs gigantic GPU com supercomputers. <laughs> and this is amazing. It's high performance computing on small data sets. And that's because he's dealing with high dimensional Bayesian inferential models and like hundreds of dimensions. And it's really, really hard to do those simulations uh, uh, needed and sampling needed uh, in high dimensions with complicated likelihoods. Okay, well, there's new, there's, there's new things. Uh, there's not only our textbook, which is this one. Uh, Phil Gregory, I mentioned at the beginning, has one. Wallen Jenkins is the, is the oldest one that's been around now, second edition. Um, and um, the um, Washington group, Ivichik, uh, uh, Delka Ivichik, who's project scientist of LSST, if you do happen to know what that is, wrote a lovely book uh, 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 on statistical methods with Python code. Ours is with R code. So we have a chick and I, Delco and I had, had beer together when he was writing this book, I don't know, 2013 or something. And it ended up we had the same chapter titles without, without, without trying. So each of us realized that astronomers need all these different branches of astronomy in order to understand their data and to do astrophysics. And so you can join any of these societies, okay? Uh, and I encourage you to join it. Um, uh, Joe Hilby, who's a senior statistician, and I uh, created a web environment that's supposed to try to allow all the different societies and all the different people interested in astrostatistics and astroinformatics to sort of a place to, to congregate, to talk to each other. Uh, it's called ASAP, Astrostatistics and Astroinformatics Portal. There it is on the web. If you get bored, during my talk, you can go ahead and browse ASAIP. Oh, for instance, there's several thousand papers here, and you can search, search an advanced topic, some words here. You could put exoplanet, Bayesian, multiplanet up there, and you'll find uh, papers that, that are methodologically oriented in that, in that field. Resources is a rather deep uh, tree of, of things. There's jobs and, and blogs and, and all sorts of curious things under there. Uh, meetings, it's pretty amazing how many meetings there are, including this workshop is in the meeting list, <laughs> okay, uh, um, uh, and things like that. So things are definitely improving, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I mean, I don't like spending two-thirds of a talk telling how lousy things are, but at least at the end I can spend some of the talk and say things are getting better. It's mostly your generation, mostly the young generation that is um, interested in this and propelling this forward. So if I have anything, I have a vague vision, a hopeful, not vague, hopeful vision of what things will be like in, I keep on changing the slide. If I'm cheerful, I put 2025 there, and if I'm less, I put 2035 there. I don't know what to say. But it'd be nice that we had a full year available in our graduate curriculum, maybe obligatory, or just available, in astrostatistics and astroinformatics. Okay, the first university to get both graduate classes, to my knowledge, is Penn State. But you know, keep an eye on Washington and, and Hopkins and Berkeley and Caltech uh, also for these kinds of classes and, and other universities. I think some of us should get a, a simultaneous master's degree in statistics or computer science or applied mathematics. Look, there's a field called astrochemistry, and those astronomers know physical chemistry, right? We have people in radio transfer who know atomic physics really well. We need some astronomers who know statistical methodology really well. Okay? Um, we got to fund this better. We got to get the research, the cost of research, really rolling so that we don't have these frustrations all the time. And, and then we, we astronomers just have to become familiar with R. The good news is you can learn R in two hours. I mean, R is trivial to learn, it's almost identical in syntax to IDL. And, and we, we had these meetings. The last one just occurred two weeks ago in, in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon. Statistical challenges, and there's still only 120 people who come to the meetings. Okay, 
And, and, and we need this to grow. We need more people to say, you know, I, methodology is really important to me as an astronomer, not just a screwdriver, a minor tool. It's central to what I do. So you should be going to conferences and, and joining up with communities of people who, in fact, do these things. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my, I don't know what to say. It's so broad, it doesn't have real content, but it's trying to change, sort of shift the underlying way we think about doing astronomy and astrophysics. To think about it as deeply involved and imbued with statistics. And it's not the only thing to think about. It's just one way to think about things. So now in the last five minutes, five minutes, I want to uh, tell you about something else. Because I happen not to be in the hands-on sessions, and you should know about this just in terms of practical software. It's called R. So here's a history of statistical computing, starting with the mainframes. All statistical computing was given to private companies. The professors of statistics never wrote any code. So the big one was called SAS. Okay, there's an entire, it was the largest private company in America for a while. It's a city in North Carolina of nothing, a city of statisticians. Okay, in the 1980s, I don't know if you know, but uh, C was invented at AT&T Bell Labs in New Jersey. And down the hall from the people who wrote C was a statistician named John Chambers. And he says, oh, I'm going to write a stat package in C, and I'm going to call it S. And they did. Okay, He's, he, I met him. He's the, sort of the grandfather of statistical computing in, in America, uh, Stanford. <clears throat> in the 1990s, um, some other, uh, you understand these are professors of statistical computing. Their entire profession is writing software for statistics. That's what they do. They're journals and conferences, and there's a whole field of these people. These happen to be from New Zealand. And Ihaka and gentlemen said, gee, we, we want to do one that's sort of more modern, that has to use the internet, that uses uh, GNU public licenses and has open source. And they looked around and they decided that they liked S. S was now a private company. And they decided, so they rewrote S in the public domain and they called it R. That's why it's called R. C to S to R. So the next one is going to be Q and P. Um, so they formed a, a lot of friends. They joined them. There's a, there's a dozen on the R core development team. Some have been there for 20 years. And they started, and they wrote a manual that says, OK, here's a basic package. It wasn't a very big package at the beginning. It was a mid-size. Also, it's a computer language, data analysis. It does all the data analysis. I mean, it allows all of data analysis. It's like IDL. It's just a language, very similar to IDL. OK? And so they opened it up. And then around 2000, and they call it CRAM, the, the, our, our, um, the open user provided packages. And they gave rules, very formal rules. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the growth of CRAM from 2001 to, 2000, to, to 2016. And, but this graph, you know, can't see it, is a linear in time and log in the number of CRAM packages. That means that for a dozen years, it grew exponentially. Exponential growth. It came off the exponential curve around 2012. Now it only grows about four packages a day. As of two nights ago, I checked, and there was 8,772 packages. But if I check today, there'll be a few more. Okay, and nobody really knows what's in them. But the best estimate that I've come was something like 150,000. They call them functions. I'm an old timer. I would call them subroutines. So think of it as a library of 150,000 statistical subroutines. That's what I meant by everything's there. Okay? The main problem is, is how do I find it? <laughs> What's it called? Where is it? That's the problem. That's why I spend my time perusing R for the astronomers and trying to put it into a book okay? uh, and, and, and consulting. Um, R has become very big. Here it is from 2006 to 2014, exceeding something called SPSS in jobs. Uh, okay, here it is, uh, data miners. The, 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 most, uh, the most important language of data miners is R, among corporate consultants, academics, and NGOs. And SAS is fourth. Okay. Here's posts on cross-validated and stack overflow R 
has an order of magnitude more, more posts than SAS or SPSS. So um, R versus Python has been hotly debated. You could go look at the, I collect the debate and put it into the software form. It's really fun. I can tell you the basic result of it, both. The professional data miner, data scientist, um, they're working for businesses. They recommend you have R and, and Python both. Each one has advantages. Uh, obviously, the advantage of R is 150,000 functions. <laughs> okay. So what is it actually doing? Well, it integrates just general data, data manipulation, and graphics. It has a, a half dozen graphics systems, okay, uh, 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 and extensive statistical analysis. That's the real strength is statistics. It has uniform documentation and coding standards, but nobody is reading every CRAN package function to make sure it does the right thing. So maybe it has a bug. Maybe it's doing the wrong thing. But ladies and gentlemen, how do you know that your photometry package from AstroPy is doing the right thing? It's user contributed software. It's the same thing in Python. So you live with that. We all live with that these days. Okay? There's no comp you want guaranteed quality control? Pay SAS $1,000 a year a machine. And then you get quality control. Okay? You, if you don't want to pay a lot of money, then you, you get what you, it's free. Okay? Caveat emptor. In fact, my opinion is base R is totally reliable. They're, the well-established packages that are in you know, you know, version 37 have been worked on for a dozen years by gigantic Max Planck institutes in Germany or something, they're reliable. And CRAN packages that are version 0.1 that were written by one master student at a minor university for their dissertation, <sighs> I'd be a little more cautious. Okay? So I think there's a range of quality inside of R inside of CRAN. Now it's fully programmable, it's similar to IDL, it specializes in vector matrix. It used to be slow, but they rewrote the compiler in 2012. It's now roughly the same speed as Python uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, MATLAB. It's not as fast as C and Fortran. None of them are, but it's no longer slow compared to the others. Um, it has very has two-way communication with C and Fortran and Python. You can live in R and call your legacy Python code. You can live in Python. You can call 150,000 subroutines from R. That's probably what we should be doing in astronomy. We're not going to give up Python. Okay? We should be doing this. We're not doing that very much. Okay? So there we go. So, um, oops. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm supposed to press this button, this button. Don't go back. Okay, that's it. Um, my talk is basically, oh, no, 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 no. There's many, many resources. There's the help files. I can't do this. I hate this. There are many, many help files. There's the task views that guide you to the thousands of packages. The vignette files are actually readable by humans, whereas the R help files are really more mechanical. There's many, many tutorials. There's 150 books. My university library gets a book every month with R in the title. This is not the only book with R in the title, right? It's 150 other books. So they're all they're useful. You know, books on you know, advanced multivariate analysis, advanced Bayesian analysis, advanced time series analysis, all in R. They're cookbooks. They're very nicely done, those. Um, there's an, there are two journals that essentially are full-time R journals. And there's conferences and galleries and companies and stuff like this. The companies have trouble because it's hard to make money out of free software. Um, so the, if you want to use R, first is the hard part. This more intellectual part that I talked about a few, you know, earlier in the talk. Knowing what do, you, what do you want to do. Then finding it. You say, oh, I want the Anderson-Darling test. Okay. Then you find it, I just use Google. I just go cram Anderson-Darling and I find it. It's right there. Uh, you write your own scripts. You'll see a script I wrote this afternoon. The scripts are typically five lines long. You set up your data, you run the R, R function in one line, and then you plot it or print it or something like this. R scripts are very, very compact, very, very simple. Um, and then understanding, oh, good luck. That's where the intellectual part is. So you spend all I recommend. I think things will be better where we spend more time thinking and less time coding. 
Okay, A through Z, each of these is like a semester course in statistics or computer science. And so it essentially has the entire graduate curriculum from a university in R. A through Z, here are some of the methods in CRAN. This is ridiculous, 150,000. But what I really want to say, let's take Wavelet Toolbox. There's like 10 of them. The main problem is which one do you use? Each one has, has a dozen functions. So it's just enormous. And this is how you find things. You go to the task views. So on, I don't know, on Bayesian, there's 110 packages on Bayesian. Most of them are not useful, in my opinion, for astronomers, but, 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 so, but some are. So for the last decade, R is the premier world public domain, free of charge, statistical, it downloads in one minute it, 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 onto Windows, um, uh, Mac OS, or Linux. Um, and it, it complements, it gives you the tools needed, not the knowledge of what tools to use, but the actual software tools to do advanced statistics in astronomy. Thank you very much. Right. So what do I think about the Julia language? Well, I recommend that you ask my colleague Eric Ford that, okay, because he is a big fan of Julia. Julia has made essentially no inroads in, into astronomy, but then R has not made many inroads either, not, not as much as it has in many other fields. Okay. So both of these are, uh, R is older, um, more vintage of Python, same era, started in the 90s, grew in the zeros. Julia is newer. Okay, it started in this decade. Okay. So Julia is nice because parallel processing is built in. In R, for example, it is one of the things it does is, is parallel processing is built in. So uh, in R, there's 100 packages to help you parallelize R and, and, and dozens of strategies and things. But, but it, they're sort of add-ons, okay, onto a single processor way of doing things. Also, Julia was designed with the scientist in mind, not the industry person in mind, or the social scientist. So, so, so Julia, I think, is very uh, tempting. Overall, those of you who are young, which is most of you, just be prepared. Every 10 to 15 years of your career, you're going to have to learn a new language. Okay? I didn't, and I really, really wrecked myself, you know? By the middle of my career, I te wasn't technically capable of doing good things. So whatever you're doing, no question, this is the Python decade of your life. Okay? But I'll bet 10 years from now it won't be Python. It'll be Python and the next one, maybe. It will be Julia. And by the time you're 40 or 50, there'll be another one that no one's heard of. Okay? So that's the, that's the real answer. <laughs> Yeah, Python does have statistical packages. First, it has basic statistics, and then it's quite strong in machine learning, where there's a dozen packages, sort of like R has a dozen packages in these areas. So it's quite strong in machine learning. Um, the main thing is variety, okay? Um, let me go to my analogy about the screwdriver. Okay, I happen to be extremely bad at fixing my house, okay? I've got like three screwdrivers, a hammer, two wrenches, and that's it. Okay, so I, when I try to fix my house, it comes, I can't do it or I do a lousy job. So if I, something serious happens, I call in a gentleman, usually comes with a truck, and he opens up his truck, and there's a thousand tools there. I don't even know what their name is. And he usually is experienced, looks at my problem, thinks about it, goes and chooses the right tool and does a wonderful job in fixing my house. That's the difference between lousy software and good software. My opinion is Python's moderately good. Well, I think the answer is I, <laughs> there's no good answer to that. Statistics is not magic. If you have you know, you know, 33 data points, you don't have many datums. You're in the kilobyte regime of information, and you're lucky to get anything out of it. <laughs> Okay, so it's not magic, and don't expect magic out of statistics. Okay, what it's, its job is to help you, help you judge what can you learn given your sparseness and your scatter and your uncertainty. And so it's sometimes it's called the science of uncertainty. Okay, and, 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 
and 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 to help you not exaggerate the importance of your results. So the answer is, I don't know. Overall, I just want to say that 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 I actually like non-parametrics to start off to see what you can learn without making assumptions because sort of non-parametrics always works, including very small samples and non-Gaussian samples. And as you do more and more parametric work, more and more parametric modeling, you usually need more data and it usually comes with assumptions like Gaussian scatter is a common assumption. So if you're not sure about that, stick, think about non-parametrics. How much time? Oh, okay. Well, I will say there's a whole bunch of people, astronomers my age, who say don't use advanced statistical methods for two reasons. First, the referee won't understand and will reject you, give you trouble, which is saying the community is ignorant, therefore you should be ignorant. And I just can't understand that one at all. Okay. And the other one is um, um, it's a black box. Well, all I could say is, is you know, way back, even when I, but when I was young, remember before, you know, we used to actually have photographic plates, and we would go to the dark room, and we would have a photomultiplier that maybe the professor built, and, and you really actually did it all yourself. And I remember I had friends in grad school who would write an entire pipeline for a primitive instrument using something called fourth, all themselves. It's just not true anymore. The pipeline is being written at ESO over a decade by a, a five university team. <sighs> or it's written at NASA, or it's being written here at IPAC. So, do you read documentation? Yeah. So, I think increasingly the instrumentation and its associated software and the pipelines, data analysis pipelines, are becoming so sophisticated that basically you can't do it yourself. Should you try to understand it? I would. <laughs> If you're doing a dissertation using one instrument, I would try to learn as much as possible. If you're doing a dissertation that involves one kind of math applied mathematics, I would go to the library and pull out one of these hundred books and read it. It's not that hard. Okay. Oh, I have a joke. Ready? Okay. Th this joke works, works best. Uh, it worked best. Uh, it, it would work better at JPL than at Caltech. They teach statistics to sociology students. It's not rocket science, and you're rocket scientists. Okay, so it's not that hard. It's mostly big. So it's not that hard to learn what's behind some of these advanced methods. It's an intermediate level of, in, of mathematics, in my opinion. And when you took quantum mechanics, you, you did harder things. So it's, you can learn it. You just have to have some guidance from things like this kind of textbook, this level of guidance, and then one level deeper, in my opinion. Reading the code itself, I think people talk about software too much. They should talk about methods. Methods are implemented in software. But the method is the intellectual part, not the code. Okay, I think I'm finished. Thank you, Deborah.